we do this research every quarter and it is now time to re-dive into the data. So they're less happy and more passionate than they were last quarter, which is bad news, okay? So so there, when I see a passion index rising and sentiment dropping, that tells me we've got a lot of angry people on our hands. It's, I think it's gonna continue to drop a little bit more. We're not at the floor yet because we're not hearing this. Like when somebody at, somebody at Pando said it best, this is the largest unheard conversation potentially in history. The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability explicit or implied shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on in the world of business, technology, and HR. Here's your host, Ira Wolf. Hey, welcome back, Googleization Nation. Welcome back to another episode of Geek Skeezers Googleization. And welcome, Jason Cochran, back as my co host. Yep, it's great to see you again, Ira, and great to be with all our listeners today. Yeah, continue. We had a chat before the show. It continues to be absolutely crazy times. I can't even keep up. As, as sort of the VUCA guy, I can't even keep up. You know, for those who don't remember or don't recall or, have, or this is the first time listener, and we appreciate it if you're here. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. That seems to be our life. I think it was the most appropriate acronym for last year. It's been around for almost 30 some years, and they describe what the world was going to be. That's what uh, Alvin Toffler in Future Shock in 1970 didn't mention VUCA, but that's pretty much what he described <laughs> was VUCA. And it's just crazy. I mean, on any given day, I mean, I look at one headline after the other after the other, and it's it's continuous disruption and uncertainty for sure it absolutely is and it's like i go from reading one article that has to do with the current labor market and the great resignation and then the very next article i'm seeing is jeff bezos who is investing money into a, a lab out in san francisco that's basically the fountain of youth they're trying to reverse the aging process yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. In a, in a race with uh, Singularity University and Peter Diamandis and and all those guys to be able to do it. So they're you know, they're trying to get to, to Mars first and 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 reverse aging. And here we are, you know, still trying to figure out the pandemic <laughs> and, and struggling. And, you know, let's take it down to our world. Uh, we're going to be talking again about recruitment. How can companies recruit better? It were, you know, 2001, and despite the fact of trying to get to Mars and reverse aging and and uh, where people are still struggling. I mean, and, and here, here's the puzzle. Recent stats are close to 11 million people are unemployed or, or there's, there's close to 11 million job openings, not unemployed, but 11 million unfilled jobs. And yet there's eight plus million unemployed people. And now unemployment benefits came off and companies are still can't find people to do the jobs. So, I mean, that's that's a puzzle. We and hopefully we, you, I and our guests will be able to help solve that because I know a lot of companies are really, really, really struggling. Cutting bike hours, cutting production, little simple things. We've we use fat free milk. We tend to creamer for our coffee. We haven't been able to get fat free, free creamer for the last two weeks. Wow. The, the shelves are bare and it's a distribution problem. And it's a distribution problem because they can't, they can't get it produced. They can't get it delivered. They can't get it transported and they can't get it out of the warehouse. Uh, so I did, did an interview last week. In fact, we'll talk about that in the second part of the show a little bit. Did a, an interview last week. I was called about the unemployment situation in Detroit, Michigan. 25% unemployment wow. in, in the city of Detroit. And part of the problem is 
lower income, education, all the things we can talk about. But one of the problems is it's automotive industry. The pandemic has hit Asia hard. Asia is the producer of semiconductors. Some semiconductors have been falling behind the chip makers. They haven't been able to produce it, so they can't ship. They can't make enough semiconductors to, and computer parts to put into the cars. And the cars are really driving computers anymore. And so therefore people can't, every, every single car manufacturer has cut back production. And since they cut back production, means people aren't working. If people aren't working, it means they're not going out to eat. They're not buying foods. They're not traveling. They're not getting gas. They're not doing all those things. And, you know, that's what we talk about, VUCA. It's, it's a complex world and we're, we're interconnected. But today we're going to hopefully help the companies, help the businesses, small, medium, large companies uh, do a better job of where where can they find people? Where Where are these 8 million people hiding and, and more, and then all the people who are on the sidelines, what, what can you do to, to track them to do a better job? And I can't wait to talk to Tracy Parsons from WorkDrive. Tracy and I met just a few weeks ago, months ago, where all runs into, you know, Blur's Day, all runs into to one anymore. And and Tracy, she, she was a soulmate. I mean, I'm, I'm talking, she's thrown out all this data. She had some research I hadn't heard yet. And she's going to share some of that today. So without further ado, let's get Tracy on here and see how we can help companies find the talent, access the talent, and then hire them. So hopefully Tracy's coming on board here. Tracy, 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 there she is. Hey, there hey. Is. hey. Te- technology, technology delays. So look at us go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> here we are. And uh, we were talking before your uh, your your wonderful community that you have in the background, your your Lego community, right? My my, my tiny town. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Very f- much fun. So Tracy, why don't you you do a better job at me describing what you do? So real shortly, quickly, what what tell us about Work Drive, which is your comp- one of your companies. Yes. Tell us about that. And then let's dig into some of the research that you had found and and very pretty raw, candid, frank data of where we are. It's like, why can't I find people? And it's pretty obvious. Yeah, it's really interesting. And thank you for having me on, Ira and Jason. It's really a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here. And I've been working in this space for over 20 years. And I've always been working in the employer brand, recruitment marketing, and really looking at ways, I mean, frankly, looking at ways to make the job search more egalitarian, right? This is a symbiosis. We need them. They need us. Let's treat it that way. And for ages, we've just never We've never treated it that way. It's always been this power struggle. And ever since, you know, they coined the phrase, the war for talent, I've just shuddered at this idea because quite frankly, that is fantastic marketing fodder. So whatever product they were selling there is great. But the reality is the job seekers have no interest in war. They just want something meaningful to do for a fair wage. Like we're making something so simple, very complicated and needlessly so. Yeah, absolutely. And, and still can't get it past, I mean, the strategies that companies are still using, you know, let, we're going to give a dollar more, we're going to have a signing bonus, uh, we're going to throw in another perk, we'll have a pool table, we give you pizza. I mean, it's like, okay, what's what's the next, you know, perk of the day? What What's the next tactic? And it's really about, hey, we're willing to give them a paycheck. And how, what can we do to help say, it's got to be more than a paycheck. People, and I think we're seeing that. We last week we had, uh, and I think you know um, Danielle Farage. Do you know Danielle? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, she was on with uh, Rosa Beltron, and we had a great conversation about Gen Z. And I mean, so articulate, so smart, so bright. And it's like we just want to find purpose. We just want to have respect, dignity. I mean, it doesn't cost anybody to do that. We just want to be able to show up and feel like we're doing something worthwhile. And it doesn't mean saving the world. It's just at the end of the day, like we accomplish something. Well, and I think there's I think that there is a growing population of people who do who do look at their work for meaning. But I think we spend an inordinate amount of time focused on that group because the bulk of the job seekers out there are they don't want to nobody wants a job. This was some of the one of the things that came out very, very clear in in the research that we did. And we did this broad scale social listening study with my partners at Pando Logic, 
And it was basically scouring the internet for comments, blog posts, social posts, Twitter, Reddit, anything out there that people are talking about around looking for a job, getting a job. We wanted to understand what their sentiment was. We wanted to understand what they were talking about. And the reality is very, very plainly, nobody wants a job. They need money. And we always lose sight of that. So yeah, I think it is great if you can show, throw an extra buck an hour to your workforce. That's going to move the needle because quite frankly, nobody shows up for free. Like this is this is the reality that we live in. We are paid to work. Work is hard. It is not fun. We have to pay them to show up and we need to start acknowledging that. And for years, we got really far away from this notion of, Oh, if we just obscure this whole idea of pay and talk about ping pong tables and talk about mini Lego cities and and talk about all these perks, then maybe we'll obscure the fact that, you know, we don't pay so well. And the reality is CEO compensation has gone through the roof in terms of compared to the average worker and the money is there. It's just not being spent in the ways that your average worker is seeing. And so I think that while the last 18 months has been really VUCA, like <laughs> super VUCA, if that's a thing, it's it's actually jarred millions of people awake. Like Lynn Bailey and I talk on our podcast about the great mm -hmm. awakening. It's not necessarily the great resignation. It is the great awakening. And I told the story earlier today when I was talking to somebody, it's like, for years, we were all on this really epic hamster wheel, right? All the workers in the world on the hamster wheel. And then somebody jammed a pencil in the hamster wheel and all of us hamsters went flying all over the place. And we're like rubbing our little hamster heads because we've been concussed from being thrown off the hamster wheel. And now we're looking around going, oh my God, there's grass out here. You guys, did you see this thing over here? I could actually do something totally different. I don't even know where the wheel is. Meanwhile, the decision makers, the people that are making, you know, 314% <laughs> more than the rest of us are over there, like putting tape over the pencil and going, hey, do you hamsters mind getting back on the wheel? And all of us hamsters are going, yeah, no, we're good. <laughs> right? So, so the, the secret is fix the wheel, right? Make the wheel better focus on the balance that you can create. Why do we have hours, right? If we can meet a production schedule in a different in a different framework, let's meet the production schedule. But we also have to look at things like where we're building factories. And I just finished a research project for a customer. I was like, "Hey, you guys, you guys build a factory where you you have 2000 people in that town and your factory employs 1600 of them and you need to grow by about 30% this year and I'm the one that has to tell you that you're literally out of people. So and then compounding that that's been you know like like you you know you're either listening to podcasts you're on the podcast you are the podcast you are the interview I, w I was on a salon yesterday and it's a group of about 20, 25 of us meet every week and they talk about different things. And yesterday's, this week's topics happened to be climate change. Okay. And somebody brought up the topic of in the South that I can't remember the exact percentage, but I think it's 24 out of 25 of the largest poultry plate manufacturers, processors are in the South, Southeast with climate change above 70 degrees chickens don't live. So you have a whole industry that is built because people were there processing chicken and meat processing and everything else in, in a climate that is continually increasing at risk. I mean, we're not talking shorelines and yeah. waters and everything, just the temperatures that we're going to have, that's going to be havoc. And then, so where are the people? And and so they're talking about, is this a revitalization of, you know, like South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, Idaho, or what about Canada? I mean, and, and then and then they came back and they said, well, that's fine in Canada, but they got their own problems because of, because of the glaciers melting. So, so, so the fact is, is that we've got all these things going around. I, I love this and we'll get back to, to talking about the data here. Uh, Tom Friedman, Thomas Friedman, 
many of most of you are familiar. In his last book, and and I, the other reason this came back to me is is because I'm teaching my organizational leadership master's program again. I thought I had a year off, and, and they said, no, no, we got like nine people registered, and we got to doing it again. So I was going to let me refresh the concept, and I just came across this. He talks about the three climate changes. It's not just the meteorological climate change, which is one, which is going to impact and change us. We have a a labor, a demographic, a social a social demographic change. And we also have a techno, a technology climate change. And all of these are simultaneously disrupting. So we actually, he talks about three climate changes. And the climate change that we talk about that we can't get our heads around is the weather. And that's only one part of it. And you, all three of us live in the technology space. So we already, you know, we already bought into that one. And then people haven't gotten into the people aspect of that right. and these are all happening simultaneously and just like we talked about with, with the uh, the climate the weather climate is it impacts where people are going to live what the labor is where what, what's going to get produced how it gets produced where it gets produced when it gets produced and we're also global right. you know, there's other places to go so let's go back to our data yes. <laughs> so we'll get off our pedestal here right. let's go back to the data you dug in, you worked with Panda Logic. You came up, you had some phenomenal data and, and I'm a data hound and you know, this is my, this is my space as well. And it was like, no, I didn't hear that one before. So share with us some of the, some of the found findings. The, you the big thing that I think that we constantly forget about, it goes back to that war for talent. Like we, we as employers, we, as people who recruit, we as HR people think that the world revolves around us. Right. And most the most <laughs> stark bit of information that came out of this was 68 million conversations happened in the last year around what is we refer to as the candidate experience and to put that in like context 68 million so that's a lot i didn't know how much a lot but that was a lot so then i looked back i was like okay well what does it compare to like something you know like a big deal like the olympics right how much does it come how many conversations were happening around the olympics in the last calendar year with a cancellation and a reschedule and all kinds of crazy scandals that happened with the olympics and the candidate experience conversation was two and a half times larger than the olympic conversation so 68 million compared to about 21 million uh, and, and it was, so that's, it's big. Everybody's talking about it. The things that we're doing to people, they're talking about it. Uh, and they're not happy. It's a very negative conversation. The net sentiment over the entire experience from job search to starting the job, the entire thing was about 40%. And so the higher the percentage, the more positive the conversation, the lower the, the conversation, the, the number, the more negative. And it's it's a generally dispassionate conversation. So the passion index, passion intensity was right around 21%. So again, the higher the number, the more passionate the conversation. And it could be love or hate. Like it's not necessarily good passion. It could be raw, right? And so it's a dispassionate, negative conversation. They do not enjoy the experience. I was surprised that um, rejection the conversation about being rejected for a job. And keep in mind, we comb through these. So it's not relationship rejection. It's not home mortgage rejection. It's job search rejection. Those, those conversations, I want to say, were about net sentiment around 30%, 34%. Mm -hmm. It bottomed out at the job application, just so you know. The job application that you all have created and put out in the universe for the people that you want to work for you, they hate it so much. Like they just don't, they don't hate it a little bit. They hate it so much. Net sentiment on applications was 2%. So if you think about all the millions of dollars that people are spending to attract the humans to come to their website and fill out a job application and then never hear from them again. So you take them from a net sentiment of about 40 and then you dump them down to two and then they never hear from you. And that's the last interaction you have with your brand. So the, just a technical question, like the net promoter score goes from a minus, you know, to a plus. So is zero like the bottom or is zero just, eh, you know, it's like sort of middle. I mean, is it, is the mind is the two negative or yes the two is negative 
Okay. Um, <laughs> I guess the two is negative. I have seen. I have seen it does go below zero. Wow. I've seen it go below zero. In That's fact, pretty, I'm, pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably not should be talking about what I'm about to say, but I'm going to anyway because. That's why you're here. That's, that's, right. why here. that's how I um, built that's why, people, work, Tracy. <laughs> that's why people invite me places. So we do this research every quarter and it is now time to re-dive into the data. So they're less happy and more passionate than they were last quarter, which is bad news. Okay. So, so there, when I see a passion index rising and sentiment dropping, that tells me we've got a lot of angry people on our hands. So it's, I think it's going to continue to drop a little bit more. We're not at the floor yet because we're not hearing this. Like when somebody at, somebody at Pando said it best, this is the largest unheard conversation potentially in history. And we all know how important recruiting is. We all need people like we need them and we spend so much money to attract them but we're not listening to them. We're not hearing what they need us to do. You know, I, well, I've been preaching. I mean, you got the numbers and and that's why I said when you, when you shared some of this, we've been, uh, in fact, next week, Kevin Grossman from the talent board is back on board. I just had a conversation two weeks ago. I was on his podcast and the, the last year through 2016, 2019, similar to what you were doing, the candidate resentment went up 40%. And I said, that's remarkable because there was something like what, $10 billion of HR tech, you know, invested in improving the experience and resentment went up. So what does that tell you? I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a, you, you need a, <laughs> a degree for correlation. And then last year it was like, oh, it went down. And it was like, everybody became a little bit more empathetic, but a lot of people have lower expectations. You know, I, I think through that whole thing and it pulled out all these people. So in the first six months of the year, it's increased 63% to date. And it's on a word trend, similar to what you just shared. So it's not like, oh, these guys, you know, here's, here's what you did. You only, you only measured 68 million conversations, <laughs> so, you know, you know, organic, what about, <laughs> organic conversations, not prompted, not anything. So this yeah, is, what it's only 68 million. <laughs> I mean, it's so, only, it's a small sample source. It's maybe statistically irrelevant. Yeah. So, so where do we go from here? So we got the problem. We, we've been talking about it. We, it doesn't seem to. You know, nobody's listening or they hear it, but they don't listen. What, what do we do? Where do we go from here? Well, it's like white man ju can't jump. Like I think they can listen to Jimmy, but they're not hearing Jimmy. So there's a couple things we can do. One, stop thinking that this is special. Um, <laughs> people need what we have. They may not want it, but we, we've got to stop marketing a Mercedes Benz because a Subaru is going to do the job. Like this is, this is not bells and whistles moments. People don't want jobs. They need money. So like help them see what the job is and what it pays. And we're seeing through Pando's data, when you include shift information, when you include immediacy, when you include the money, they convert at a higher rate. We don't have to oversell. We could just tell them what it is. I mean, it splits me away. I mean, as we continue to have this conversation, and so right, people want money, and they go, um, but we don't want to. But boss, the manager, the CEO says you can't put salary in, and we just had this whole conversation with Alex Murphy from you know JobSync, yeah. and uh, we we just did an interview. I think it comes out next week, and we were talking about the new Google apply. You know, and Google said three years ago, you don't put you don't put the salary in mm -hmm. your job posting. Yeah. We're dinging you. We're not going to, we're not going to boost your, your posting. It's going to get buried. So pay us, you know, you can pay, you can either pay to get it up there or put your job posting in there or put your salary in there. And the fact is, I don't know how many times I said this over the last three years, because so few people put it in. If you put it in, you have a natural advantage, a free advantage, put it in. And it's the number one thing that candidates want. They want to know at least what some salary expectations are and some benefits and they go, yeah, but we can't get approval for that. Right. So you're going to continue to have fun not meeting your quotas. You're not going to be able to hire. It's going to take you longer. You're going to be inefficient. And as a leader of a business, you can totally make that decision. Or, <laughs> or you can just let go a little bit. And I think that's one of the things that all of this, all of the data that we saw, like everybody just wants companies to just 
lighten up, like just <laughs> let go. Just we're people, you need people, you know, how about we speak the same language? How about you set expectations with me? Like we heard this over and over again. We get them on this hope despair loop, this endless cycle of hope, despair, hope, despair. Just tell them what's next. Be very plain about it. People understand being rejected. They don't like it, but at least you you close the loop, right? So, and we hear that all the time. And the other thing people want to know, how did you handle COVID? Did you learn anything from that? How are you growing as a business? How are you taking the last 18 months of shifting, changing, and, and migrating and working in different ways to learn as an organization, to make your organization better so that I can have my expectations set as a candidate of how you did. And if you didn't do well, I ain't coming. And this probably ends, opens up a whole other conversation, but just as you said, is what have you learned over the last 18 months? And then you get this edict that comes down is, oh, we're a hundred percent on site in two months, or we delayed it a month which just pushes out the uncertainty when everybody, when 70% say we want hybrid, we're willing to come back, but not every day. And they go, well, that's not an option. Right. And then again, you can make that choice as a leader and people are going to make their choices. Like until we start treating job seekers and workers, like a symbiosis is right. We're seeing what happens. But my customers, I mean, as, as you were as you were sharing, it's like, well, we don't want to tell people what, how much we're going to pay. Well, let's say you have a major campaign, you have great ratings, you have great, great products, everybody loves it. And you go, we're going to make a decision. We're going to take the pricing off and we're not going to tell anybody what the pricing is until they walk up to the cash register. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden sales go away because nobody yeah. wants to go through that disappointment. It's like, oh, I can't afford this. Why is it? Why is the price change? Why is it this? And you'd say, well, change it. Let's put the prices back on with so let's let's take that another level, Ira. Let's say that you've decided to, you've had the best product in the world. Everybody is excited about it. You remove the prices and you increase their risk of being turned away at the register. Right? So not so not only have you paid to attract me to your product, and I'm very, very eager to know how much it costs because I want to buy it and I'm getting my checkbook out and it's still the right amount. And then, or my checkbook, that's hilarious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I just actually had to write a check today. It was so alarming to me. Probably <laughs> you're clap, clapping on, clapping the erasers on blackboards, right? What's happening here? <laughs> and so you go to swipe your, your watch to pay and they're like, sorry, you're not qualified to buy this product. Right. So we always forget in recruiting that 90% of our transactions end in dismiss, in disposition, yeah. in, in exiting, in disappointment. So don't, don't get more. More is not better. Better is better. Yeah. And I think and Kevin and, and the whole talent board, you know, they say it over again. We're, we're not, I think Jerry, uh, I, I, I always want to say Jerry Springer, but <laughs> Jerry Crispin. I don't know why Jerry, uh, Jerry Crispin always says we're in the employee rejection business. Yeah. It's not employee selection business. It's an employee rejection process. And it's how do you prevent disappointment turning into resentment and anger? Yes. And I tell people like your goal as a t talent acquisition strategist is to create fewer sad people. That should be your goal. That's where your bar is. Did we create fewer sad people this month? Then yes, great, right? That's a good bar because the bar that we've set for ourselves is not shared by candidates. Like we are we are speaking different languages. We do not set their expectations and they're starting to get very resentful because we are acting like we're on a power trip. I can't tell you how many C-suite executives I've met in my career that said people would be lucky to work here. I was like, no. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I run my own company and I know nobody's lucky to work here. It's hard. We, we expect a lot yeah. and, but we, you know, we, we pay you and and we're, we have fun. We're lucky, we're as employers, we're, we're lucky to have the good people that we get. Yeah. We're the one that, that are lucky. We're the lucky ones. Yeah. yeah. And the, conse the consequences, it seems like there, there's no hiding now, right? No. It used to be before, like if you had a bad candidate experience, maybe that person complains to their family members or some close friends about, hey, you know, this was a terrible experience. I wouldn't recommend you work here. But what has been going through my head over this last week was when Danielle and Rosa were with us last week talking about Gen Z. Danielle made the comment, 
we have eyes and ears everywhere. Yeah. And the, we have so much information at our disposal. We have platforms where we all talk together around the world. And if you think that your employer brand can escape a bad candidate experience, you're kidding yourself now. There's no more hiding. No. And so it's just alarming to me why these companies won't even do something as simple as posting the salary. Are there any clear reasons as to why they still operate that way? Yeah, one of them is we don't want our current employees to know that this role pays more than they make. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. And I always, <laughs> but, 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 fix that. but we are committed to diversity, inclusion, and equity. Oh, but, of course. but we don't want anybody else to know that we right. may be paying people unfairly. Correct. Or differently. Yes. <laughs> but we're committed to it. We're dedicated. We're ready to go. <laughs> yeah, we say we have, we say all the good words. We say all the good words. They're just not matched. Indeed, to your point, Jason, not only are there platforms everywhere that are telling these stories. I mean, I see them everywhere. I've I've got a Gen Zer in my house. I I always like to tell people that I'm the world'st old, world's oldest millennial because I, I get all the I get it right and and they are they're talking about it that's why we did this social listening study because it's not just about telling your friends and family they're going to take to Reddit they're going to take to Twitter they're going to take to their public Facebook they're going to take to all of the channels that they have access to to say this was messed up and I don't think you guys should go get this messed up either right so it's not it's not just that it's all the platforms and frankly their eyes are wide open they see their bullshit meter is off the charts <laughs> yep, yep absolutely and not just that generation the entire again what i saw in the data was the bs meter is ringing like mad they're not buying it so tracy we you and i and jason can go on forever yeah. and, and uncover turn over a lot more rocks some of them are in plain sight. Tell us, we didn't talk a whole lot about Work Drive. Tell us a little bit about your company and then kind of final words. Yep. So Work Drive is a really simple internal mobility platform designed to make it easy for your best people to stay. So in the midst of all the great Novel resignation, ideas. it's very simple, right? So you have data on all of these people. We pull it into Work Drive. They confirm this is their profile. They tell us a little bit about what they like, and then we match them to jobs internally. But we also give your internal sourcing teams the ability to source your own talent, but we do it anonymously because we think that there's a tremendous amount of bias in promotion and elevation and mobility. And so we mask your talents profiles and we just hope that, and we're seeing that the best people with the best skills are bubbling up to the top of the lists and getting tapped for new roles internally. And just so people are clear, I mean, this is way more than an employment gauge and survey or, or a survey. I mean, you're, ca you're capturing data from all over the place. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Looking in the HCM and the ATS, allowing uploads and, and we're really, it, it truly is. Again, we hear this all the time. Well, we have, we have an internal job board. I'm like, yes, you do. And I will tell you that your people are five times less likely to use that internal job board because you treat them like everybody else. See, we, you touched on this, Ira, at the beginning and why a lot of HR technology fails and why ours is showing to be pretty successful at this early stage is that we designed this for the people. This was not designed for the organization. This was not designed to make it easy for leadership to, to do what they needed to do with their employee data. This was legitimately designed to help people stay, make it easy, and elevate in an unbiased way. We've been running how people can get a hold of you. We got work drive, so I certainly can learn a little bit about that. What about you, Tracy? How can people get a hold of you if they have questions or want to follow you? Yep. T Parsons on Twitter, LinkedIn. I look pretty much like this. <laughs> and uh, Tracy Parsons, Tracy with an E, T R A C E Y. And LinkedIn, that's me on the. If you want to, if you want to drop us a, an email, I get all the emails at hi at workdrive.com. So, you know, that's the life of a startup founder. You just get all the emails. And we will put those links in the rights and the show, up, show notes and the blog and everything else, else out there. It's great to see you again. Any any final words, final comments? What should no, we No, the only thing I would just say, you guys start listening. If you have an opportunity to talk to a job seeker, ask them the hard questions and be prepared to just absorb that information. You do not have to respond. 
You do not have to ask. Listen to understand, not to respond. Yeah, it's so crazy. I mean, so many people say, well, how would we find that out? And my answer is always ask. <laughs> not hard. Doesn't cost you anything. Don't have to buy. Don't need a new budget. Just it's not a big question. <laughs> and your recruiters are talking to people all legitimately all day. Like you could, and if you would like to email me or hit me up on Twitter, I'll give you the three questions you should ask every single candidate. It's three questions. And you'll need, they'll need to do that. So yeah. Tracy, appreciate it. Stay safe. Have a great, uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch. Can't wait to yeah. see the next, the next quarter research come out. It should be fascinating. Maybe we can get you back on or we'll, Sounds good. we'll, we'll be talking about you one way or the other. Uh, <laughs> safe travels, stay safe. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Thanks, guys. Tracy. Not not disappointing at all. Tracy Parsons keeps keeps us alive. And, and again, I, I knew we talked about some of the data. I forgot some of the numbers, but thinking about that, listening in on 68 million different conversations and pretty clear message and companies still aren't getting it. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we changed a few minds or at least turned a few heads today, Jason. We are going to take a short break. We're going to be back for our second segment. We ran a little bit over, so we'll have a few minutes here, you and I, Jason. But thank you, Googleization Nation, for, for being here. Thank you for listening to another episode of Geek Skeezers Googleization. We will be right back in a few minutes. Stay tuned. We hear from our sponsor, Success Performance Solutions. A lot of you might be feeling like you're standing in deep shift. But do you know what grows and rises out of deep shift? Opportunity. To successfully navigate the shift to the new normal, each of us must learn to rapidly adapt to the speed of change. Some of us are hardwired for this. Others, not so much. That's where Success Performance Solutions can help. Success Performance Solutions is now your AQ headquarters. Whether you are personally struggling with the next chapter in your career or wondering how ready your team is for fast, disruptive change, our AQ assessment and coaching will provide you a detailed, scientifically backed roadmap to guide you into the new normal. Optimize your adaptability today. Contact Success Performance Solutions about evaluating your team's change readiness or joining our upcoming AQ Masterclass. Visit SuccessPerformanceSolutions.com or call us at 800-803-4303. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to our second segment of Geek Skeezers Googleization. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. If you're not a member yet, it is free. And you please join the community, googleizationnation.com. Uh, you'll get updates generally weekly about some webinars, other events, things that are going on in our world, think, summaries of the podcast, and so forth. So uh, we have a, a, a thousands of people that are part of it, and hopefully you'll continue to spread the word being part of Googleization Nation. Jason, we talked about in the first part, a great interview with uh, Tracy Parsons from WorkDrive. I highly recommend you go up and uh, I follow her. It's fascinating information she has. But I mentioned during that, that about the Detroit unemployment, you know, 25%. Great. And lots of reasons we, we got into it, not necessarily because they had 25% unemployment, because, you know, one of the reasons was the supply chains. And, you know, we can talk about meat processors and food and, and you know, almost any supply. Customer service is short, you know, call centers are short on people, long delays. People, people are, are not getting the service they need. But this, you know, we started, we started out the show talking about headlines that, that pop up. And... This is, I think you and I have talked about this in the past, but the Wall Street Journal had a report just maybe Monday, maybe on Labor Day it came out. And they they just said that 61% of the student population that just started college, 61% are women, highest ever, all-time high, used to be about 70, 30 to men. For those of us who are around a while, I mean, I when I went to a class, you know, and started college, you know, 50 years ago, there was a, it definitely was a predominantly male class, especially for the professionals. Women, women went to state colleges via teaching degrees and nursing degree, or, or they went to nursing school. And then all of a sudden, even medical school, you know, medical schools, law schools, accounting are now predominantly female the, wow. that, that are entering in there. But, but men, men, the men's rate participation rate dropped to 40%. So only forty wow. percent of men, in working age men in college, three three point eight million women applied to college last year, two point eight million men, a million more women. So that, those numbers keep increasing, 
And then I thought this was incredibly powerful. Higher education have one, colleges, universities have 1.5 million fewer students today than they did five years ago. Now, part of that could be pandemic, cost, tuition rising, is, is a four-year degree really worth it, so forth and so on. And yet, at the same time, is every one of the jobs that we have requires more skills. <laughs> you know, we, we got this we got this opposite trend. But I thought this was incredible. Out of that decrease in the number of students, 71% of the decrease is men. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, you make up 50% of the population, 51% of the population. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes you wonder, like, have we reached a point where a lot of people now have, you know, young adults believe that college has let them down or it's not everything that it's cracked up to be in terms of looking at the cost? Like, is it worth the cost for what I'm going to be making? Or are there other ways that I can get the learning and skills that I need in order to have a happy, successful life? It makes me think of Mark Cuban a few years ago. He got on a high horse about competencies and he was railing about you know, higher ed institutions and requiring degrees. And he was started talking about, no, it's about competencies. Like, yes, if you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, some of those professions, yes, you do need to be in school for a long time. But for a lot of the other kind of degrees that students may seek in college, they could easily just take a few classes, do apprenticeships, internships, things like that, micro courses, micro learning, and have the credentials and the competencies necessary to enter the market and do and apply those skills and do the jobs that those skills need really well. And so it makes you wonder if they're starting to, if we're on the, the precipice of there being a moratorium of some of the upcoming generations, potentially, and not seeing the value and the return on the investment of college as what previous generations have, or is it more to maybe what you're saying? It's just because of the VUCA right now and the, the pandemic of what we're dealing with. I guess time will show us you know, over the next few years, if these trends hold true. No, absolutely. The end, you know, part of this is the underlying theme is, and, and I'm not the first person to say this. I mean, I'm basically, we're, we're, we're just kind of reiterating what other people have said, but it's, we, we're moved past the knowledge world. It's not what we've learned. It's we need to move toward a learning mindset. It's not graduated school, I've learned this, I've done this, and you go, great. And it's sort of, so what? What, what did you learn today? What did you learn tomorrow? How, how are you applying what you learned? What's differently? What are some of the assumptions that you had in the past are no longer valid? What, what are some of the things that you have to question? So as we move forward, we're really moving from, it's really a continuous learning. It's not, but it's beyond just education. It's not, well, I'm going to get my, get a two-year degree, a four-year degree. I'll get my master's. I got my PhD. I'll get a certification. It's not just accumulating all that. It's really learning. It's really learning how to learn, not learning how to get a degree because now everything, you know, everything just changes so quickly. Absolutely. You know, there were a couple of things that Tracy brought up today, too, that just were fascinating to me. I could have listened to the two of you just riff on recruiting and candidate experience all day long. That was a massive, <laughs> did. It was incredible. And I know it was great for our listeners, too. One quick comment and then one question I'd love to get your, your thoughts on. A quick comment was, you know, when we think about, you know, employee experience, candidate experience, new hire experience, you know, experience is kind of the big buzzword now for a lot of things and and for good reason. But unfortunately, you know, it seems like in many years past, and we're still doing it today, sometimes the wrong human is put into the human-centered design process. And by that, I mean the leaders often inject themselves as the person with whom they're thinking about the different strategies. And it's like, no, employee experience, the reason it works well now is because we're putting the employee there. You said it earlier, we've actually got to listen to them. And then we've got to have an iterative process in place where we're continuing to gather their honest, candid feedback, and then we're responding to it and putting structures and things in place that align to the result, what we get. And unfortunately, a lot of times the breakdown is, I've found, even in schools, is you put the wrong person in the middle of that experiment in terms of who you're trying to get information from. And I think even in years where maybe they would have tried to put the employee there, it's, I think it's challenging sometimes for leaders to not inject their own biases or things that they want to see as part of that, that candidate experience or employee experience. 
Now, the question that I have for you is we talked a lot today. Tracy provided some great data that money is what really talks, you know, to a lot of candidates. And those are the things that they want to see. In, in your opinion or the things that, that you come across in terms of research, does elevating minimum wage, particularly for some of these jobs that are hard to fill, do you see that as being something may not be the panacea, but is it part of the equation in helping to fill some of these vacant positions around the country? Yeah, one is that it's a really, really complicated answer. And, you know, we got like two minutes here left to do it. So thank <laughs> But continue to have this conversation and hopefully we can get somebody else on it. One of the questions that's going to come up right now is, will money make a difference now that unemployment benefits have have gone away, the extended uh, unemployment benefits? And, you know, in fact, I did an interview with that. And, and uh, Roxy, if you can roll the, I think I sent it to you, the successperformancesolutions.com forward slash media. Yep, people can go up there. I did, I think, seven interviews last week about different aspects of, of this. And But the bottom line is, is that the unemployment benefits that came off in 27 states, I believe, prior to this, didn't. there was no uptick in that. So it wasn't keeping people from going back to work. There are other reasons, and I think we shared some of those, you know, today with Tracy. Ultimately, you know, people need money. People need to have a fair living. And people going to have this huge transformation over a dollar or two dollars no i think you know to, to have a fair wage in many cities i think we talked about this on one of the other shows i think some of the cities the more expensive cities is the minimum wage needs to be like 22 or 23 dollars an hour to lift people out of poverty i mean we're not we're not talking about making them wealthy we're not talking about t- even taking them to the middle class we're talking about for sustenance because of rents and food and transportation costs are so high in particular areas. Um, but on average, even in the poorest states in the country, I think it was like $13, you know, Mississippi, Alabama, West Virginia, I think it was about 13 or $14. So just to treat people fairly that they're going to work, that they're feeling, feel like they're being treated with dignity. They can put food on the table. They can take care of their families. They can do what they need to do. Yeah. I mean, should people be paying seven or $8 an hour? The answer is, you know, no, and I think those days are gone. Hey, we give them benefits, benefits, and they don't realize how expensive healthcare is. No, they don't. But that healthcare, you know, may save them money when they need it, but it doesn't help them put food on the table. So I think there's a rude awakening. You know, companies are going to have to figure out how to make that model. It's not only going to be disruptive. A lot of businesses are going to are going to fail because of this because they don't have a good business model. And uh, we're going to have to change that. And we keep, I keep looking at uh, our warning here. I keep getting a warning from Roxy. So we can be on this, uh, our sandbox, our, our soapbox for a while. But it was a great conversation. And hopefully we're going to have, con- you know, many more of these. If anybody, anybody out in Googleization Nation, any of our listeners, we really value you. If you have any thoughts, if you agree, disagree, please let us know. We may even welcome you to come on the air with us and, and chat about it. But again, thank, thank you very much. I know you have a million choices here every week. Appreciate you being a listener for Geek Skeezers Googleization. Hopefully, if you're not a member yet, you will join Googleization Nation. Jason, any final words there for the week? So, really enjoyed it today. I learned a great deal. And I know that our listeners did too on, on recruiting and candidate experience and looking forward to continuing it next week. And I'm excited to having you uh, nearby, side by side. Look forward to each week to having you back. Until next week, don't let the shift your plans. 